Hey, what's up YouTube? Today we're going to do a video on the ban list in 2014. Um, it, I guess we're talking about hat format, but we'll start in January and March just to kind of talk about some of the decks, because these decks actually resurged quite a few times during that format and were still played. And you can see the impact of hand traps and stuff where some tier 3 and tier 2 decks ended up going up a whole tier. So Michael knows a lot about this format, and so do I. I think we both actually met each other around this time, too. Um, playing casually. <laughs> it was interesting. Yeah, and I think I was still doing Zombie uh, Beals Turbo. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so getting into it, uh, the first deck I'm going to talk about Also, this doesn't list here is that I believe that this was also the point when Fire Fist had different uh, variations in what was uh, was it Axis was the term they used and how many yeah. Fire Fists yeah. were actually in the deck because there was like three Axis wasn't there and like five Axis and I can't remember the breakdown because it's been I, some time. I believe the one that, every, that they ended up settling on was the Pluck One Fire Fist. Yeah. That. But I know there was subcategories for Fire Fist, so this kind of catch-alls it. Like, it's stupid that it catch-alls of it, because it's not really catch-all, because there was very there was a lot of different variation in Fire Fist. So when we say Fire Fist, there were very many... It's kind of like the Pendulum Magician decks of this era, whereas we break them down now into uh, um, FTK and just, you know, the standard builds. Fire Fist also had a lot of variation to how they were getting that plus one or if they were just a splash. much to say about Mermel's Iron, and they still OTK'd, and uh, I believe it was like Abyss Megalo was just such a powerhouse, and the fact that you got these effects off of using him, that was just, you know, so now you're, rather than actually gaining card advantage through some of them, you're just making your opponent lose card advantage, so you were just kind of like, I'd pop this spell, I do this, I set up, and I just kill you, so... Felt like it was a little counterintuitive at that point to <laughs> what was big, but I'm not an expert on Mermals. I played very little of them. I played a few times. I actually used the eight. Well, that used to be one of my most hated decks, and then I played it and I thought it was a blast. Alright, <laughs> uh, but moving on, since I'm pretty, I'm sure a good chunk of you know about Mermals. They're not much different back then, other than 
You gonna cover cover the Girgia Katakuri or or Katakuri, or are you just going to? Well, I was gonna I was gonna wait to cover Girgia. Okay. Uh, I mean, because like Katakuri and Girgia Katakuri popped up for a while for a few months, and then okay. decided Girgia was better. But uh, Heretic Dragon Rulers. This was a deck that had. So much presence and like recyclability and OTK and uh, this was a deck that seemed like it was the catch-all deal, like for a deck. It had OTK, it had recycling, it had resistance. It was keep in mind there was no Raigeki this format. There was no Raigeki. There was no almost everything mm. targeted and or destroyed. So Drake of Back was the menace. And uh, it was really hard, and Teratic could throw off dragons for free just to throw off dragons. And dragon rulers didn't care. They just wanted dragons to banish and summon themselves. So it was a really powerful OTK deck it, that could also grind if it needed to. So to give kind of i I'm scrolling down through this, to give you kind of a look at what was... Uh, how bad it was. You had your uh, banned traps, all the good stuff banned by 2014. Wait, we, we're not on that list yet, are we? So we're January, March, so I went too far. But just to give you kind of a general idea of how powerful this format actually was, um, we already had, like, Raigeki wasn't there. You had... No super rejuves or anything. So this deck just kind of was throw all the best of, you know, the deck into one thing. You're cool with one, too. So, like, your board life and your keeper weren't there. Yeah. No. And from Battle Trap, this is around the era where Battle Trap kind of stopped to slow down a little bit. This is also the format where Solemn Warning was at one. Torrential Tribute was at one, like we said. Like, a lot of these cards that just wiped the field or dealt with the field were, you know, and this is before we had things like Solemn Strikes and everything else, so... Impulse and Book of Moon were considered very powerful cards back then. Yeah. Uh, next deck, I'm moving on to Boogian. Now, <laughs> for... Those of you who don't know what this deck did, there were two variant of Bujins. One of them is the one that everybody knows, which is summon Bujin Yamato and activate like Kaiser Coliseum with the back row and just sit on, on your Yamato and let Yamato get you all the advantage and they will never be able to kill it. And protect that Yamato until you're ready to kill him. And then there was uh, later on, it came out later. But uh, later on, in, around the time Hat came out, there was a swarm fusion where they used some of the fire six cards in order to throw out a bunch of monsters and try to OTK. And they also have the, if you didn't open up that, they could also sit back and sit on Yamato. Yeah, but you sat on Yamato, you had your Royal Decrees because battle traps were pretty terrible to run into at this deck. I mean, you were literally, you just put on a helmet and you just... You didn't let them play the game. Like, yeah. so, moving on, because Bujins are, are we going to cover any of Tier 2, or are we just going to? Yeah. Yeah. I'm covering <clears throat> the first four of Tier 2 on this, because they are actually relevant. Yeah. Which is, uh, the Infernities, Infernities were, and until they got, until they got Archie Limited, they were this really good swarm deck. They went from being a tier, like one, almost zero deck, when they first came out in the Synchro era, and then they limited a card, and then they kind of fell off, and then they started resurfacing, and started winning more tournaments, and then they limited their barrier, which could negate anything except for Summit, and for whatever reason, after they did that, it spiked in win rate. Well, yeah, no, that's because people were only running one anyways. In fact, the joke of the community was, uh, what, you're running more than one? Do you even infernity? 
I think the spike was this was also around the time that people saw the uses of Lavavel Chain. Lavavel Chain really Lavavel. increased. Didn't he come out around this time? Lavavel Chain has been out for a while now. Because he came out around the same time that he used this. But it wasn't. But like the only decks that really used them at this time was Infernity. No other deck really cared, really wanted it. Like it was like sending a card to the graveyard is good. But it's not really necessary. Uh, my tier four deck did. I ran zombies <laughs> with the monk engine. Infinity was that deck that it didn't care. You you make me go first. Cool. I set up my board and set a bunch of trap cards to negate and destroy things. Make me go second. I throw out a bunch of monsters to try to kill you. It was a very very powerful deck that was considered a tier two deck, or because it was a very underplayed deck. Not that it wasn't as powerful as the tier one deck. In fact, in this year, it actually won the world by like it destroyed the world. But it's one of those decks that like felt like almost a catch-all deal type of deck. Hmm. Yeah, but they definitely had access to that Lavavel chain. I think it was just people discovered how powerful it was to set up your deck. Because you could put yeah. your what's-his-face on the top of the deck and then draw him and, oh, hey, reveal him because I drew him, no cards in hand, rawr. He'd also send Spagin Street Patrol if it helped you. Basically, what it, it also helped you uh, set your permanent and burn the arch chain with it. Did they run Summoner Monk in that version? Because I imagine yeah. if you went discard spell with Summoner Monk to go into Armageddon Knight, I believe is his name, and then you send a Dark to the Grave, and then you can go into Lavavel Chain, and you've just, you know, milled whatever you need to or set up your next card. They did. They, would, they ran Armageddon Knight. They ran Summoner Monk. They ran one Dark Grepper. Because Dark Grepper would get more monsters out of your hand. But the whole point of Eternity is get empty-handed as soon as you can. And they ran, uh, around this time, they also started running one copy of Archfiend Eris in order to send with Lavalvo Chain to search the Archfiend. Yeah. To detap and then banish the Psyche and start the search. But moving on, I mean, we don't want to spend too long <sighs> talking about one deck. Alright, um, I'm going to only briefly cover this because it only talks Harpies, there was two versions. There was the one that could to throw out rank sevens and use Dragon Ruler Tempest, because uh, Harpy Channeler has an effect that states that if there's another dragon on the, if there's a dragon on the field, her level becomes seven. So you would make Draco sack a big guy. At this point, uh, here to uh, consider the rank four deck version was still considered better because around this time was when number 101 came out. And number 101 Silent Honor Art, although it's like, why aren't you running Castell and everything? Because Castell was considered better when it came out and it is considered better still to this day. Number 101 is. Or was considered to be like the most one of the most broken rank fours out there. This, this is a format where rank fours really started to like show their power. Moving along though is uh, spellbooks and AKA prophecy. So spellbooks were considered tier one, tier zero about a few months before this, and then almost a whole year before this, and then. Uh, their copy of their most broken card, one of the most broken cards ever printed, Judgment got banned. And the deck was still destroyed. So they limited Fate. And this was around the time Fate got limited, but it was still this really powerful deck because it could, it had non targeting destruction removal that it could search, even though Spellbook and Fate wasn't one, the whole deck all it did was. It was a very, very powerful toolbox deck that could 
get out of like any situation you could think of to get in. The only thing that the deck didn't have was they, they really couldn't OTK very well. Oh yeah. Yeah. But Judgment and Fate, Are definitely good cards. I'm terrible at this, like, adding up and doing cards real quick, just give you a general idea, because editing is not my playhouse. So, moving on. I'm moving on to, uh, Sylvan. Now, Sylvan, at this time, uh, this was before Solitar to come out. They were considered an okay deck, they were, but they felt like they were lacking something. But, later on, in hat format, they were one of they were a tier one, almost, or they were a tier two, almost tier one deck because of the broken field at the time you could make with it. So going, the Lone Fire Blossom had been at two for a long time, and then the Sylvan deck came out, and then all of a sudden they unbanned, they said, you can have three Lone Fires. And people were like, it looks like they're trying to push Sylvan, and then Soul Charge came out, and then going Lone Fire, Lone Fire, Lone Fire. Soul Charge for the three Lone Fires was the really powerhouse play. Okay, yeah. let's move on because we probably want to actually get to Hat, which is what I wanted to kind of make the video about. Just, just give a little bit of a pretense now. to what? That's what we're talking about now. Yeah, Skip we're. Over to Gia, talk about the most freaking, the most relevant deck of the format, the one that ever, the one that the format is listed under. Now, for those of you who don't know, HAT stands for Hands Artifact Factor. So, at this time, uh, we had gotten our first movie, or our first anime pack, which was called Dragon the Legend. Now, when the set first came out, uh, and it was slowly getting spoiled, besides, uh, there was no real cards, uh, there was no real cards at first that, pe that piqued people's interest. And Fire Hand and Ice Hand were shown, and people were like, Wow, these cards look amazing. And then, uh, and then Soul Charge got shown. So, Fire Hand and Ice Hand, what they did is, for those of you who are completely new, when they're destroyed in your possession, so even if they use the one solemn warning on it, you still get their effect. So, they get destroyed, you can target, Fire Hand targeted a monster to destroy, and Ice Hand targeted a or trap cards, and what they do is, if you did destroy what you targeted, you special summon out the opposite one. So, Ice Hand would summon out Fire Hand, Fire Hand would summon out Ice Hand, and it became this really hard thing to get through, because you often had to get rid of your own resources to try to out their field, and it was really, it felt really bad, because you couldn't realistically do that. And this is right when the format had, like, low down to the point where plus wanting every turn was considered absolutely busted. And that's what the trap tricks added to the deck. The trap tricks were now searching bottomless trap hole, which was at one. But that didn't matter because the easy trap hole had come out. One that shook up the format and actually people had to play around it completely, which is the trap tricks trap hole nightmare. And, uh, Moral Tech also had come out at this time, too. So all these cards had come out around the same time, and it made this really powerful plus one stun deck that, I can't say dominated the format, but was considered to be the best deck of the format, because it had a good matchup against all the other decks in the format. But in to also, to also give you a note of how powerful the Dragons of Legends was, a card called Mathematician was also printed, and it was a very cheap card when it came out. I remember because I traded for two copies of it by trading one fire hand to a person. I took that loss, but overnight it shot up because a card Mathematician um, can't remember what decks it would boost, but basically you got to Foolish Burial, a level four lower monster. And then when he gets destroyed by Battle in the Graveyard, draw a card. So in a format of slow grind like this, it was great. But Also, uh, I'd like to clarify something about Hat Format. Like I said, Hat was considered to be the best deck, but there were so many contenders. What I mean by that is, I believe Hat was the 
most diverse format in all of Yu-Gi-Oh! history. And you can yell at me and you can call me an idiot. So a lot of people hated this format, but I personally loved it because you, it felt like as long as you played uh, good cards, like good, the good staple cards in it, you can play whatever deck you wanted. So this is also the format that or this is also what our current format is shaping up to be. As long as you're running the good cards of this format, you can actually play just about any deck. And that's also why I wanted to make this video to prove my point that I am right and everybody else is wrong. But a lot of other people, I think, are agreeing with the fact that we're actually shaping up to be very much like a hat format right now. Because if you have access to the hand traps and you have access to the great link monsters... It is literally hat format. To put in perspective, though, back when I played in this format, people were actually crying that Firehand, Ice Hand needed to be hit. When now they are actually not that great of cards. So it's it's like because cards are expensive, people will cry that they need to be hit when they're not really that oppressive. Because Firehand and Ice Hand were easy to work around. You just had to make the right calls in oh, not awesome. setting your spells and trap before you go into the battle phase. Also, Vanities, Vanities was at three. I was going to bring that up, that this was a format where Vanity's Emptiness was at three. <laughs> was it at three at this point, or was it at one? I can't remember. It was at three. It was at three at this point, and Hat was the only deck that or Hat and Boosters were the only deck that Ran it, but Pat ran it at like two. Some lists ran it at like two in the main board, one side. Some lists just main deck all three. Other lists didn't play it at all. Pat was also a very diverse deck. It was more of the player's choice of what they wanted to play. But yeah, Fire Hand and Ice Hand were believed to be like very powerful cards. Which to could be wrong for their era, they were powerful. But then you have things like Artifact Sanctum. Which literally brought out Moral Attack, or if you were going against, uh, yeah, it just it brought out Moral Attack. I can't even bring up like anything else that it was like. It, we also, uh, played, it, what's it called? They, at this time, there was a lot of hat lists that ran uh, Big All Tech, which is the Red Sword too. Yeah. today's format we're getting that diversity but hey this is just our video on it one day i'll probably touch up on this on the even better video and this one will probably disappear but um to sum up hat format fun you should try and play it just look up the list and find some friends and play the format you'll have a lot of fun because almost nothing in hat right now is super expensive <laughs> but that's all um, if you guys, if anyone has a birthday that they're having today, happy birthday to you, and, well, at Janky Yu-Gi-Oh, we like to say, keep playing the game, I think, because I love Yu-Gi-Oh. I don't want to learn how to play another card game. So, catch you guys next time.